Previously on the Craft Parenting Podcast, the temperance movement won, the beer industry lost, and beer was ruined for generations. Before Prohibition, Cincinnati had been making more than 2 million barrels a year, and Cincinnatians were drinking two-thirds of it themselves, but the taps had run mostly dry. Prohibition has been repealed, and it's time to get the beer flowing. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Craft Parenting Podcast, the podcast about two Cincinnati craft beer lovers with a, well, let's just be real, it's severe this time. It's a severe parenting problem. A little bit. Yeah. The the, the kids are a little much right now. We're um, attempting so to get Elliot to go to bed, but he doesn't want to listen. It's mildly frustrating. And by mildly, I mean a lot. But we shall get through. We are day drinking, though. We are day drinking. We screwed up, you guys. We didn't have an episode last Thursday. No, <laughs> we um we fell asleep in Lily's bed a little too often. Be like, hey, we're going to record a podcast tonight. And then, oh, wait, you fell asleep in Lily's bed and I can't get you up. Okay. Yeah, I did it first, and then you did it second. Yeah, but you love me. I love you. It It is what it is at this point. So thank you all for being here. My name is Joe Ludwig, and that voice that you hear is my lovely wife and co-host, Caroline. How's it going, Caroline? Did you know that Brink's Nightcap, their holiday ale, Still tastes delicious almost 24 hours after you open the can, because I learned that today. Yeah, (laughs) because you fell asleep last night, too. I did, but I had the foresight to throw my beer in the fridge and stick it in this cool de-drinking koozie from Shift Beers. Yeah, shout out to Shift Beers. They, uh... Well, shout out to Truth Beer and Pod, first of all, because they organized a live episode recording at BC's Bottle Lodge in Montgomery, which is their home away from home. Yeah, you got to go hang out there. I got to deal with some shitty situations at home. Yeah, we'll leave it at that. But I got to go to the library and get Indian food with the kids, so that was lots of fun. (laughs) Yes. And you'll, or I guess you already posted a blog about that because that was last week. That is correct. So make sure you go check out that. And if you want to listen to that live episode of Truth, Beer, and Pod Sequences, it's the latest episode as of this recording. And I make a guest appearance on it. You do, along with some other Cincinnati beer podcasters. But you're the most important one. Yes, thank you. Do I have a button for that? Thank you, thank you. (laughs) Though I heard my name a lot during podcast recording, so. Hmm. They did sing your favorite song, Sweet Caroline. Yeah, I heard about that. If you want to listen to that episode, I am on it. Most important person on it. I make a brief appearance. And um, you can get that, Truth Beer and Pod Sequences, on all major podcatchers. Or I embedded it on our website. So it is up there. It is live. You can go listen to that right now if you want. Yeah, and Joe was super nice and pulled a, if you want to know more, you have to listen to the podcast. As he was recapping the events of the night after he got home. So, no spoilers from Joe. Love you, hon. So, this week, we are finishing the f- the trilogy. Yes. The trilogy of episodes all about the history of Cincinnati craft beer. And this three-part trilogy is based on a book that you got from the library, which you did not steal. 
I did not steal. You returned it. And then promptly checked it back out again. The yes. librarians had zero issues with that, though. They almost sent the mafia after you. I I was one day past the 31-day window. I, I was, was one day past the 30-day window because they sent me an email and said, hey, you have 30 days before we're going to start charging you for this book if you don't return it. Oh, boy. But then I returned the book, so all that went away. So what is this book again? It's called Cincinnati Beer by... Michael D. Morgan. And to be clear, we separated this book into three parts. It is nowhere close to everything in the book. No. It's only, we only covered three chapters. There's at least... Maybe four, but yeah, we mostly covered three chapters. Yeah, so if you want to know more about Cincinnati Beer in this book, we only covered a very small portion of it. So make sure you go buy it or I guess check it out once Caroline returns it. The library has a few copies. If you put a hold on it, I have no choice but to give it back. Yes. So make sure you go check that out and read it and um, listen to the podcast this episode for a brief, just like a, a snippet of the book. Yep. So we'll get into that shortly, but first, let's talk about what we are drinking. All right, Caroline, I noticed that, as mentioned before, you have an adult beverage. Well, we both do, actually. Yes. So I am drinking Nightcap by Brink Brewing. It's their holiday ale. We drank it as part of our holiday beers episodes. We have talked about that one before. And then once I'm finished with this one, because I think Elliot, he is finally laying down and I think he's sleeping now. Knock on wood. (laughs) After I finish my nightcap, because I'm getting close to done with it, I'm going to have an Urban Artifact Strawberry and Lemon Fruit Tart Seltzer, which is 15% fruit and 5% alcohol. Alcohol? What was I going to say instead of alcohol? I don't know. Who knows? This is a real fruit tart seltzer, and it's made only with whole strawberries and lemon zest. No flavorings, no extracts, no concentrates. All natural. I'm looking forward to trying this. So we went to Urban Artifact after we went to Humble Monk a few weeks ago, and I just like randomly grabbed things out of their cooler and was like, you sound interesting and you sound interesting, so I'm going to take you home. And the strawberry and lemon seltzer six pack was part of that. I'm going to take you home. Yeah. And Urban Artifact is a local brewery here in Cincinnati. It is in the north side community of Cincinnati, which, um, as you said, we went to a couple of weeks ago. And basically right across the street, maybe a block over, is a brewery called Humble Monk. And it has a cute little logo of a monk on it. Whose beard is a hop cone. Yes. It's a, I love that logo. But we went there and we got some to-go beers. I posted about uh, the pancake porter, I believe, on my Instagram. Earlier. Potentially. Yeah. You post a lot of beers on your Instagram because beer is good. Beer is good. Beer is good. And stuff. Yeah, I I like to publish what I'm drinking. So I I am drinking one of those to-go beers from Humble Monk. We are both going to drink from North North Side, I guess, this episode, once you finish your brink beer. Which technically, oh wait, are those inside the 70? No, those are outside. Those are on the west side of 75. Therefore, they're both technically west side beers, as is brink. So we're just drinking all West Side beers right now. Yeah. Whoop, whoop. West Side, Best Side. You haven't made a button for that yet. No, I need you to record that solo. Um, anyway, so I am drinking Humble Monk. We walked in and it was a great experience. I highly recommend it. So I am drinking Uncle Gid's Farmhouse Ale. It is 6% ABV and 26 IBU. I'm not really a farmhouse ale person. I am. That's why I got it. Yeah, this is supposed to be yours. Um, but like I said, we I had the 
the equipment set up the other night and I I opened up here in anticipation of us recording. Mm-hmm. So. Wait, I do notice that in the show notes, I'm supposed to be drinking a Westside Brewing's Gill and you are supposed to be br- drinking a Humble Monk Pancake Porter because that was that was originally the plan <laughs> like five nights ago. Yeah. So the Farmhouse Ale, I don't know a lot about Farmhouse Ales except they can get kind of high in alcohol and they can get a little bit funky. Uh, funky is a good way to put it. A good funk, though, not like a bad funk. Right, right, yeah. But th- this isn't any of that. Um, it's kind of middle of the road ABV, and I don't really taste it. Just it just tastes like an ale to me. Like uh, it tastes really good, actually. Mm-hmm. May I try? Yeah, because one of the reasons why I got this crowler, well, I, technically it's a sixteen ounce can. One of the reasons why I got their farmhouse ale in cans was because I wanted it in my flight, but they didn't have a keg that was cold. So he wouldn't serve it to me because he wanted to make sure that I had a good drinking experience. So I was like, I'm going to get it in my to-go beers then because I like me a good farmhouse. Ooh, that's a good farmhouse. Yep. Yeah, he literally canned this in front of us. Yeah. So did did he offer like a crowler, like a 32 ounce? No, they only have 16 ounce cans. But they have labels for all of their beers on draft. So you get a labeled can versus a um, like handwritten label that most breweries do for their crawlers. Yeah, the plan is to write kind of a, a review of our experience. Oh my goodness, little dude. He's still laying down. He's just like singing. Yeah. Oh, he's like hugging his dinosaur. <laughs> he's got his, di- his big dinosaur on top of him. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, so uh, let's uh, march on. And um, yeah, so highly recommend Humble Milk. And not a big fan of the sour Midwest fruit tarts, but... I am. But yes, you are. So I highly recommend Urban Artifact. Oh yeah, I definitely highly, I highly, highly recommend anyone try anything. It's just Urban Artifact isn't my favorite, but I do like. I think it's called Gadget. It's like a raspberry. Yes, I think I got a six pack or four pack of the Gadget because I knew you would drink at least one of them. It's just not my go-to. I prefer the multi, multi beers. <laughs> So now that we know what we are drinking, now it is time for What's Bugging Caroline in Children's TV, where you, Caroline, tell us all about the lack of physics and logic in children's TV. So uh, take it away. Daisy Bo Peep has lost her sheep and we're gonna help her find them. So Daisy has lost 10 sheep and we have to find them. We found the first one, like right at the start of the episode, because it was in the clubhouse making noise. And we're like, oh, there's a sheep. We have to find the sheep. And then Daisy and Donald pop up like, hey, have you seen Daisy's sheep? Because Daisy had 10 sheep and now she has no sheep. So we're like, well, we found one sheep. So we have to go find the nine other sheep. So we're all going to go look for the sheep. But Daisy, you're going to stay here at the clubhouse and watch the sheep that we've already found. But Daisy's the one who lost the sheep in the first place. How are we sure that she's not going to lose the sheep again while we go find the other ones? Maybe Daisy should go try to find the sheep while someone else watches the sheep who will be less likely to lose them. She doesn't seem very responsible. No. (laughs) She lost them the first time. How do we know that she's not going to lose them a second time? I don't know. Fortunately, she does not. And we find sheep all over the place. They're like up in hills, super far away. They're like up on shelves in the shoe garage. How'd they get up there? Maybe they mixed up sheep with goats when they were thinking of things that can climb really, really high or like jump really high. Can goats climb? I don't know. But like every time we find a sheep, it's like, oh yeah, I'll come back. So it's like, why did they run up? Well, whatever. That's because it's a children's show. We can't just go chasing after every single sheep like it's a rodeo. That'd be a bit much. I don't know what Elliot is doing. (laughs) 
He's just sitting up now. <laughs> Boy, go to bed. It's nap time. <laughs> So, I mean, I, in the end, Daisy kept an eye on the remaining sheep. But, yeah, maybe somebody else should have gone and watched those sheep. Is that everything that's bugging you this week? That's it for this week. Now, on to the main topic of this week's episode, which, once again is based on a book that, Caroline, you are reading. And this is the final part, part three. So there are two other parts that we have recorded about this book. The first part was all about pre-prohibition and the rise of the craft beer industry in Cincinnati. The second part was all about prohibition and how basically the craft beer industry was shut down because of the government. Mm-hmm. The war on drugs wishes that it was prohibition. Was it the 19th Amendment? Or it's no, it's the 18th Amendment. Because of the 18th Amendment, I think 19th is women's suffrage. 19th, 19th is women's suffrage. Okay, so the chapters we're going to talk about today are liquid bread lines, and we'll get a little bit back, we'll get a little bit into reinventing flavor from the book Cincinnati Beer by Michael D. Morgan, published in 2019. After Prohibition was repealed, it was very hard to get a beer. Most breweries had closed their doors, and the ones who hadn't couldn't just start the beer flowing by pulling on a tap. While beer sales could resume April 7, 1933, most breweries didn't have beer to sell. Bruckman Brewing in Cincinnati had been upgrading their equipment during Prohibition and was able to start selling beers at 12.01 a.m. April 7 to a large crowd. It was the only brewery in Cincinnati selling beer on day one, but others soon followed. So it was illegal to sell beer? Was it illegal to make beer? In large quantities? So it sounds like they were. The reason why Bruckman Brewing was able to sell beer day one was because they had gotten permission to start brewing beer like two weeks. So it passed, but there was a... There was a waiting period. Yeah. And Bruckman got permission to start brewing beer so they would have beer ready day one. But technically, it was still illegal. They just had special permission saying that they could, in fact, do that. Interesting. That, this is so interesting because was it illegal to make the equipment, like the tanks and stuff? No. So they had been upgrading their equipment during Prohibition in hopes and plans that beer would soon no longer be illegal. Most breweries did not. Bruckman was a little bit different where they decided they were going to start upgrading their equipment, modernizing it more like they were in Germany. Okay. So, like, they couldn't profit off of the equipment. Probably sat dormant for a hot second before they were able to use it. But they all, they bought it and stuff during Prohibition. But Prohibition was an entire decade, right? Yes. It started in... 1920. Yeah. It ended in 1933. So, more than a decade. So, that's like an entire generation. Yes, an entire drinking generation. Well... Oh, that was good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you are opening your Urban Artifact. I am, which is going to be very different from Nightcap. Oh, no, those are basically the same beer. Um, a little tart. It's you, really good. Your lips just <laughs> puckered. <laughs> it's, it's very, it's always drastic when I go from drinking an ale <laughs> to... A sour. <laughs> oh my goodness. Your whole face just puckered. <laughs> Yours did too. Is this a sour? Or a seltzer? Yes. It's a seltzer sour. So or this sour is a, seltzer. So it's a seltzer, but it has fruit in it. Like actual fruit. Yes. It's real fruit and real tart. I think that just ruined the, the farmhouse that I'm drinking. <laughs> <laughs> you got tart in my sour, in my seltzer. You got seltzer in my tart. But I guess my question is, if you are a brewer and you haven't brewed it something for 10 years, quote, technically, does it just come back to you? Like, do you go back to an old recipe? I'd assume you go back to old recipes, but we're also dealing with the end of World War I. World War II is getting ready to start ramping up. It's harder to come by wheat 
and beer ingredients. Mm -hmm. Because there's all of this conflict throughout the world. So you kind of have to just work with whatever you can get. This is 1931, right? This is 1933. 1933. So Hitler is He's starting his jam. Yeah. He's not going to invade Poland until 39. Yeah. But we're still at the end of the Great Depression. Things aren't right. exactly great. Right. The Dust Bowl and all that. Yeah. So after Bruckman was able to open the first day, the other breweries were typically dealing with what was considered inefficient equipment at this point. So other breweries that had opened hadn't been upgrading their equi- equipment. And since refrigeration now existed, it didn't make sense to throw something in a cellar for weeks or months. It could go from a tank to bottling in about three weeks with the right equipment, which is more in line with how most beers can go today. I think it's a little bit closer to two weeks for an ale these days, but that's a lot closer to what we're used to seeing now. They didn't have refrigeration style, right? So they had refrigeration in 1933. 1918, it was a lot more expensive and you were more likely to have ice houses. Refrigeration was starting to become a thing. But it didn't really start to kick off until like the mid-20s. Okay. Like industrial refrigeration? Or... Yes, that wasn't reliant upon ice houses. Where you have a building that's full of ice that you pumped like glycol or something through to then cool your tanks in the next building. Or the lagering tunnels, right? Yeah, or you are very de- dependent on your lagering tunnels. I don't know. I, I guess that would be more like the 1890s, 80s. Yeah that they did that so most breweries that closed during prohibition saw their buildings turn into other companies since they were located in the urban core of the city the few buildings that remained with equipment were turned into new breweries making cincinnati's brewery count 11 by mid-1934 so about a year later we were up to 11 breweries from one in the city of cincinnati world war ii saw hardships with grain shortages and a few breweries closed but they got back to making more than 2 million barrels of beer a year. So is grain the same thing as wheat? Wheat is a type of grain, yes. Wheat and barley are types of grain. Hop is a flower. Okay. So as stated at the very, very beginning of this episode, before Prohibition, Cincinnati had been making more than 2 million barrels of beer a year with quite a few breweries. Now we're down to 10 to 12 breweries are able to make 2 million barrels of beer a year because of these increases in efficiency. I only have to have stuff sit for three weeks before I can get it out the door. I don't have to worry about getting stuff in and out of my lagering tunnels. But Cincinnatians and the nation as a whole were moving away from keg sales and into a preference of bottled and canned beers. Bottles and cans meant a more stable beer after transit, and it didn't matter if the beer was made down the street or across the country. Even as early as 1934, the five big beer brands had 14% of the nation's beer sales. Hmm. Does he say who the big five were back then? Um, I know it is like Anheuser and So Miller. even back then Budweiser existed. I don't know the history of Budweiser. I know it's an American beer. Bud Light is American Pilsner. Same thing with Miller and Coors and and all that. Yeah. So Anheuser-Busch, Miller, and Pabst are the ones that he specifically mentions. Anheuser. Anheuser-Busch, Miller, and Pabst. So PBR was already a thing, kind of. Yeah, I knew PBR was old. I knew Budweiser was old. I didn't know that Miller was was that old <laughs> at least the 30s that's almost 100 years <laughs> you know, as of this recording mm-hmm. so by the late 50s so the big five had 31 percent of the beer sales and it was getting harder to compete with them tv commercials helped propel these national brands who then had 80 percent of the u.s market by 2009 holy moly <laughs> the years have been marked by multiple breweries closing either they couldn't compete waited too long to expand, or didn't have the marketing campaign to expand sales. So there were a few breweries that were like, oh, we're doing pretty good on beer sales. We'll wait till we have a bit more capital to start expanding. And then by the time they got that capital they were looking for, 
number started going down because if Anheuser-Busch can pop out 30 cases of beer a minute or some ridiculous number that I'm pulling out of my butt and they can ship it to your city, how are you going to be able to compete with that if you can't match those numbers? So did they invest in equipment just like, uh, what is it, Breckman? Breckman? Is that the... Yeah, Anheuser-Busch did. Yeah, they started off strong after Prohibition. So what the Big Five did was they started off with lots of equipment and canning and bottling right off the bat and just flooding markets with their beer wherever they could and then backing that with advertising campaigns. So so I guess in the 30s that would be radio. Yeah, so it started off with radio and then would turn into TV sales or TV ads. And like Anheuser-Busch would spend on one Super Bowl commercial what a smaller beer brand would spend in a year, maybe. So it's hard to compete with those numbers when you're looking at someone who can market on a national scale. Yeah. Hudipole ended up doing what most local breweries couldn't. They bought breweries that were on the brink of closure, had a light beer that held 40% of the regional light beer, beer sales by 1982, and they were able to release a craft beer called Christian Moorline Select in 1982 before craft beer was a thing. So Hudipole Shaving? No, just Hudipole at this point. It was just Hudipole. They bought the reci- the Christian Moorline recipe? They, brought, they bought the Christian Moorline brand. The brand? Yep. Okay. And then decided that they were doing really good with Hootie Delight. Mm-hmm. Because it was a light beer, people loved it. It was a big hit in the region. And back then, you could drink at eighteen something called two three beer. Yes. Which I don't know if Hootie Delight was two three beer. I'm not sure either. I know your parents talked about drinking it, but yeah. your mom also had a tap in her basement that was run by her dad, so they could get beer whenever they wanted to, as long as they didn't skim too much off the top. <laughs> <laughs> So the Christian Moorline Select was a gamble to make a darker lager for a niche market that wanted darker, more flavorful beers. The beer was a big success and the first American beer to pass Rheinheiskabut standards. Okay. The Rheinheiskabut is the German purity law. Yep. Which means you can only use water, hops, uh, barley, wheat, whatever. And then later they discovered yeast. Yes. So it was three ingredients, and then they increased it to four when they discovered that their magic mixing wand was actually yeast. Yeah. So, I mean, it's crazy that in 1982, we were able to make a beer, was the first beer to pass the Reinheitsgebot. But, like, Bud Light is a rice beer. One of the reasons how they get it so light is because they use rice to make the beer. Mm -hmm. And actually, Bud Light, you were telling me, that's actually a, a very difficult beer to make. Yes, it is one of the hardest beers to make. Because since it has such very, such little flavor to it, your water profile can make or break that beer. So places where Budweiser has plants that make Bud Light, like specifically St. Louis, they upgraded the water treatment plants in St. Louis for the whole city of St. Louis. So St. Louis has brewery quality water because it was cheaper for them to upgrade the water treatment plant than it was to try to change the water coming into their building. And the pipes and stuff, right? Yeah. I'm not sure exactly what they upgraded with that, but... It has a pH level that is consistent. So it's your pH level, it's your calcium, it's all of your mineral levels. All of that deeply affects the flavor of your beer. If you're super serious about home brewing, you start off with distilled water and treat the water yourself to get the mineral profile that you want based on what style of beer you're making. Yeah, but we make darker beers anyway, so it doesn't really matter. We're not that picky. Yeah, we're not that picky. We don't enter competitions. We have not made our own recipe yet. Yeah, if you if you want to if you want to enter into a, a home brewing competition, that's when you would, you know, be really picky about stuff like that. So, they had Christian Moorline Select which they released in 1982. And they then followed that up with other specialty releases based on Cincinnati's past beers. They were actually mildly successful in releasing beers that were not 
light, virtually zero flavor beers, Mm -hmm. which was what at least the market was telling people that they wanted, whether or not they actually knew what they wanted. So while the, while these craft beers helped for a while, by the mid-80s, sales were starting to go down again. So Hudapol combined with Shane Lane in 1986. So that's when they became Hudapol Shane Lane. Okay. It was mutually beneficial for both companies, since Shane Ling was mostly popular outside of Cincinnati, so both brands were able to grow. So Shane Ling is the one that has Little Kings. Yeah. And like Hudapol and Christian Moorline beers don't necessarily compete with Shane Ling. So they can use that, like, hey, you're already in this market. Let's throw this other beer right next to it to try to expand their market without super competing with it. Yeah, and Little Kings, um, for those who don't know, that used to be the the beer of choice at Christmas (laughs) on my dad's side. Y'all would go through a case or two of Little Kings and, like, a bottle of Jaeger, but you guys weren't making um, broiler makers with it. You were just doing shots of Jaeger. And then chugging bottles of Little Kings, complete separate activities. Well, we did, we do a, a toast. That's typically, unless my brother has the hiccups, that's typically the only Jaeger we consume. Okay, this is true. <laughs> but Little Kings is a cream ale, and they are, are they 10 ounces or, or smaller than that? They're like 8 or 10 ounce bottles. They're they're smaller than the typical American 12 ounce, which is already skimping from the European standard of 16 ounces. I prefer the 16 ounce. Actually, if uh, if I can choose, I prefer the liter. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer the Germany standard of beer. But um, in America, you typically have a 12 ounce can but little kings are in green bottles and they are i think 10 or 8 i'm trying to they're definitely seven fluid ounces how much i'm pretty sure this says seven i'm trying to find so we were both wrong it's not even 10 or 8 it's seven well whatever it is it is smaller than the the standard but the alcohol content is is up it's five and a half percent it's wow. seven ounces and five and a half percent uh back th- for back then i mean it was, it was that was yeah that was a high ale that was a high abv for back then yeah because the standard back in the 80s was like you know bud light levels which i guess bud light is four two Present day Bud Light is four two. Yeah, uh, Bud Light or Budweiser is five. So this is a little bit above Budweiser, um, but in smaller quantities. And the rumor or the legend or whatever you want to call it is that at lunch, the construction crew would go to lunch and then they would have these little bottles in their pockets and they would chug them. While and they were on the work site. And while they were on the work site, and then they would go back to work. So according to the Little King's website, it was originally brewed by the Shangling Brewing in Cincinnati, Ohio. And legend has it that the sweet cream ale was created when the draft beer cooler went on the fritz at Cincinnati's famous Montgomery Inn. Because refrigeration was a finicky thing in those days. The regular patrons loved... Shangling's cream ale as a side chaser for their bourbon boiler makers, but didn't want to buy full size bottles. Necessity led to the invention, and the king was born. The delicious cream ale with subtle sweetness was an instant hit, and the seven ounce bottle became the perfect sidecar chaser. So, literally, it was made as a chaser. I'm going to copy this link so I can throw it in the show notes. Okay. So, it was like a. Did it mention lunch? So, they would go to lunch at Montgomery Inn? They didn't mention lunch. They just said that the people at Montgomery Inn super liked using Shameling's cream ale as a chaser, but didn't want a full bottle of the stuff. Oh, gotcha. Well, I heard that, you know, workers would, would take it to lunch with them yeah. <laughs> and then chug it. That's what you heard from me. Yeah, I don't... Was I don't, that on a beer tour? That might have been on a beer tour. You know, so take it with a grain of salt or whatever. So... 
Hudipole and Shanling combined in 1986. It was good for everybody. But, of course, as these things go, the companies couldn't agree on where to go. And so the Hudipole Shanling Brewery was sold to Boston Beer Company in 1996. So they couldn't decide, like, whether they wanted to go in the craft beer direction or stay in the light beer direction. They had too many visions and couldn't kind of find a path. So they just kind of went off in different directions and all got mad at each other and were bought out by Boston Beer in 1996. I didn't realize Boston Beer owned Hudipole. That's that's really interesting. Uh, yeah. So Boston Beer was still brewing the beers, but by 2001, they stopped. And while Little Kings and the occasional Christian Moorline beers could be found on the shelf, the brands were no longer owned or brewed by Cincinnatians. Boston Beer, beer might have been brewed in Cincinnati, but not many other beers were back in 2001. Okay, so Boston Beer is owned by Jim Cook. Yes. Who it, is a Cincinnatian. So yes, he's from Cincinnati originally. His so. father used to be a brewer in Cincinnati, which is one of the reasons why he wanted Boston Beer to be brewed in Cincinnati. So beer would continue to be made in Cincinnati. So that in early 2000, Greg Hartman came into the picture, which I'm sure he's mentioned in there somewhere. Yes. And he... And I guess a group of people invested in the Christian Moorline name. And he slowly, over the 2000s and 2010s, he slowly brought Christian Moorline and Hudapole and Little Kings back to Cincinnati. Yes. Um, and we lived this history. So we, you're we flipping did. through the book. but And I'm like, hey, I remember that happening. Yeah, uh, Greg was telling us about it in real time um, because during the stupidest day of my life <laughs> when <laughs> I went, when my friend turned 30 yep, in like 2013 or something, we went to like 10, 10 breweries in Cincinnati or something ridiculous. We rented a, mm -hmm. we rented a Peterman bus and we went from brewery to brewery. Listerman was the first. Greg Hartman met, uh, met us at the Christian Moorlane Tap Room. It was 2013 or 2014. Don't the quit. Tap Room was still very young as far as being a thing. Like the, the Logger House had been around for at least a year. Okay. But the Tap Room that was, was very new. Yes. So, yeah, so don't quote me on the year. So, um, and he gave us a tour and he gave us hoghead, hogshead cards which I guess you, it's like a club that you do at the logger house. So the Hogshead cards get you a 22-ounce pour for a 16-ounce price. So you get four extra ounces of beer, and they come in a cool mug that has Hogshead on the side. Um, another way to get a Hogshead card is by participating in all three beer series races. Really? Yes. Do now, whether or not that's still a thing, I don't know. When we first started the beer series, one of the way so you got a Hogshead card at the end of the Huda Pole race, mm -hmm. the Hootie 7 or 14K. Okay. Actually, it might have even been at the after party, which was like a full two weeks after the Huda Pole race. Like oh, they had a special okay. thing and they were like, okay, this is, and you could, you would sign up for your Hogshead card online and you could pick it up that extra that special day where they had like free appetizers or something that they were giving out if you had been a brew hog. a hog a brew hog yeah but we're like oh we already have those cards we've had those cards for like the last five years because yeah, at so that point greg personally gave it to us yes so and fortunately by that point i had joined in so i got a hogshead card and joe got a hogshead card and so we could both always get 22 ounce pours so, anytime we go to Moorline Lager House. Which we frequent we frequented quite often when oh, we yeah. had when we had uh, season tickets for the Reds. At least two seasons. So we had the weekend pass. This is Cincinnati's recovery and then super fall from Prohibition. We went from brewing two million barrels of beer a year and drinking two thirds of it. Okay, Two. so in twenty in two thousand one, when we stop, that this is where the the history stops at this at this, at this point. 
So at this point, how much beer is brewed in Cincinnati? Uh, Boston beer. That's it. That's pretty much, pretty it. much it. Other than some fledgling home brewers. So we have Boston beer in Over the Rhine uh, on um, what's Central Parkway. Yep. And we have Greg Hardman watching the last batches of Cincinnati beer come off the line at the West West Sixth Street plant before they shut it down. And no more Cincinnati branded beers are made in Cincinnati. That's sad. Very sad. So we're gonna end on a downer. <laughs> I mean, we've ended on a downer before. <laughs> but so. I promise you, things get better. Yeah, as we're drinking our craft beer, Cincinnati branded craft beer. Okay, so that's kind of a cliffhanger. Um, maybe in 20 years we'll pick it back up. We'll see. So now it is your favorite segment. I Such hear. favorite, very segment. <laughs> It's my favorite, at least. It's time for Joe's Dad Joke of the Week. <laughs> you moved it. I moved all the button, All the buttons. <laughs> so it's now time for Joe's Dad Joke of the Week. Hi, I'm Joe. <laughs> Hi, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> it's so far away one day i'm going to control the board i'm gonna do it okay i will hold all the power so caroline what's the difference between deer nuts and beer nuts i i i'm afraid to ask i don't know what beer nuts are always over a dollar Deer nuts are always under a buck. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness. That was, that was unexpected. It was unexpected. Yes. Good job, Joe. That does it for this week's show. Thanks so much for listening. Make sure to like, follow, and subscribe to us on social media. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Craft Parenting Podcast. You can also get a hold of us via email at craftparentingpodcast at gmail.com. If you like what you hear, please leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. Make sure to share the show. It's what helps our show grow. If you'd like to send us stuff, such as fan mail, pineapples, craft supplies, or sanity, we have a P.O. Box. And all this information is available on our website, www.craftparentingpodcast.com. That's where we post all of the show notes, plus lots of blogs about some of the stuff that doesn't make it into the podcast. And if you are so inclined, you can follow me personally on Instagram at craftparentingjoe. And you can follow my side hustle on Facebook at Caroline's Creative Crafts and at Caroline Creates Crafts on Instagram. I'm about to post the embroidery project that I worked on during this episode with podcast equipment in the background because multitasking is what my brain decides that I need to do. And with that, I'm Joe. And I'm Caroline. See you next time on the Craft Parenting Podcast. I had a professor, I, no, I was a teacher in high school 
who sent out, who sent around a sheet and said, um, sign if you want to end women's suffrage. And like half or three quarters of the class signed it because they thought it meant suffering and not women's right to vote. (laughs) That's pretty funny. I mean, you see videos all the time of, of, I guess, YouTubers, you know, trying to trick people on college campus into abolishing the First Amendment. Yeah. It's pretty funny. Because they don't. Yeah. Or like, what's the state that's farthest west? Or what's the biggest state? Well, everybody thinks it's Texas. No, it's actually Alaska. Farthest west? Wouldn't that be Hawaii? Biggest state. Oh, the biggest state? Yes, it's Cal- actually Alaska. California? Alaska. Largest landmass state is Alaska. Second largest is Texas. Is that population or landmass? Landmass. I don't know. Is he still awake? No, he's still he's sleeping. I don't <sighs> know whether... He's sleeping next to or underneath his giant dinosaur, but all I see is the giant dinosaur. Oh, boy. 